Welcome to the next lecture on graphical models. In this lecture, we will study several algorithms for inference in graphical models. So what do you mean by inference in graphical model? Uh, let's take this example of a uh, directed graphical model. I have five nodes, A, B, C, D, E, and there are some edges, some directed edges between them. And as we have studied before, uh, this what this graphical representation means is that the joint distribution between A, B, C, D, and E can be expressed by the following factorization. P A times P B times P C conditioned on A and B, P B, P D given B and C, P E given C and D. So the uh, uh, so you take one factor for every node, and it's that node given the parents of that node and which, which is obvious from the graph. So this is the factorization. And what, uh, so, so far we have studied what is how to get this factorization, what are the additional conditional independences. What does inference now means is that uh, you were uh, given this graph and the corresponding conditional probability tables for each node, you want to evaluate the joint probability distribution a b c and d so the joint probability distribution means it's a for the discrete case it's a full table by the way note that even though i have written down the conditional probability table for discrete distributions it's also very much possible that uh, these are not discrete so a b c d are random variables they need not follow discrete distribution they may follow a continuous distribution say gaussian distribution uh, and then the conditional probability table would no longer be a table, it would be a distribution where it's kind of like PC given A and B, which itself might be another Gaussian. So it's, it's it, you replace the table by a Gaussian for the continuous case. Or not Gaussian, any, any continuous distribution for the continuous case. Uh, but let's, uh, since it's easy to understand, let's go, uh, go ahead our, with our discussion with discrete distributions. But uh, important point to be noted is that all these discussions that we do can easily be extended to the continuous distribution case. It's, it's obviously extended to the continuous distribution case. All right, so in the inference, we want to sort of query or find out several kind of probability values involving the variables in the graphical model involving the variables a b c d and e so these probabilities they may either be marginal probabilities they may be joint probabilities they may be conditional probabilities whatever you you can find out uh, different probability values for example if you are given this graph this uh, example graph that we are considering uh, uh, previously yeah so the, uh, the, the student performance graph, so you have a grade of a student depending on the difficulty of the course and the intelligence of the student and the SAT exam score depends on the intelligence of the student. The recommendation letter uh, rating depends also on, depends directly only on the grade. So you might ask question, uh, what is the probability that uh, the student gets a, a particular, uh, okay, a, a, any student gets a good grade and the course is difficult? This is a joint probability query. This is a finding out this query, finding out the this probability value would be an inference task. Similarly, you might ask the question that given a student is intelligent, what is the probability that the recommendation letter is good? Okay, so this is a con conditional uh, inference task. So this way, uh, so inference task is nothing but finding out various kinds of probability expressions or values involving the variables in the graphical model. Uh, if it is a if it is a uh, joint or a marginal distribution, then there is no constant. It's it's for any value for a and b in the domain of a and b. But if it is a conditional, usually the condition part, it's a constant. That means is given or observed. So, for example, I might want to compute what is P A given C, where C is the constant, uh, C is observed, already observed, and we set it to a constant. All right. So, uh, 
so these uh, these are the um, uh, these are the kind uh, so so inference is basically finding out this kind of probabilities so let's see how do you, uh, how do you, let's take this small example for example i want to compute pa given c equal to small c uh, you know from the definition of conditional probability to compute this we would need this and this probabilities and p g c given c is a marginalization or summation over all values of a p a c so first you find p a comma c equal to c so you look at the joint probability table you mark out all rows where c equal to small c and marginalize over a b and d and e marginalize over b and d and e so this is the full joint table you look at only rows where c equal to small c and you add up over or marginalize over b d and e to get p a and c equal to c joint probability of p a and c equal to c what is the p c equal to c it's nothing but the marginalization of this probability again with respect to a with respect to a so summation over a, all possible values of a p joint probability of p a comma c equal to c and then the conditional probability is just the ratio of these two quantities so what we observe is that uh, in order to find this simple joint probability uh, simple conditional probability we total need the total number of summations assuming except each of these terms are binary assuming if you have more the domain is larger you have even more number of summations is uh, 16 for here 16 for here, two for here, and two again for here. So, so many additions and divisions you need to do. So, total 20 individual terms need to be added or divided, or something has to be done. Here, there is two terms, here, there is two terms, here, there are 16 terms. So, so many terms have to be um, computed and added and divided to find out the answer. To do the inferencing, and if you have a very large graphical model, this actual actually turns out to be uh, very high, uh, computationally very challenging. If you have a large graphical model, but the thing is that uh, you can actually uh, uh, actually reduce the computation by reordering the uh, reordering the variables, reordering this this uh, steps of the computation, reordering the terms that you compute. You can reduce the total number of terms that you compute. Uh, here is, a, of course, I mean, let me give an example. Suppose uh, x takes on two values, x1 and x2, y1 takes on two values, y1 and y2, and this is a typical summation that we do in the marginalization process. So as from the definition of marginalization, you can see that if you navely do it, you need to compute four terms, x1, y1, plus x2, y1, plus x1, y2, plus x2, y2. Four terms you need to compute and add them up. Whereas, if you do the computation in the following way, that first you add x1 and x2, then you add y1 and y2, and then you multiply these two terms, you do only with three computations. So, so, uh, uh, just rearranging the terms or reordering the operations can reduce the total number of computation. And this becomes the foundation uh, of a mo of more efficient methods for, uh, for inferencing in probabilistic graphical models. So let's take this example. Um, say for example, PA joint of PA and C equal to C, I want to compute. And this I have said is that summation over B D E P A into P B into P C. This this is a this uh, note that in the earlier case I was doing this summation over the joint probabilities. Over the joint probability P A comma B comma C equal to C D comma E. And this joint probability, because of this graphical model, because of this factorization, can be expressed as this product. Can be expressed as this product. Okay, so this directly follows from this definition of the graphical model. 
from the factorization given by the graphical model. And now let us see. Let us see that see some of the this is a summation. This is actually a triple summation over B, D, and E. So this is actually a triple summation, which uh, contributes to the computational complexity. Now we see that some of the terms are independent of B. Some of the terms are independent of D. Some of the terms are independent of E. So we can consider those terms as constants in this summation process and push the summation inside. And push the summation inside. Uh, let's see uh, what is happening. For example, you see that only this term is dependent on E. Only this term is independent on E. E is not there in any other term. So in this triple summation, the E part can be pushed only in front of this factor. Similarly, uh, the uh, only uh, the D factor is only in this factor, only in this factor. So you can push the summation over D to only this factor. And B involves this, this. So I can push the summation B to this complete thing. And out of which A again you can take out because C A is independent of B. So if you do this summation, it's basically P A times summation over B pb into pc equal to c key comma uh, given a comma b and uh, this is this, these are also interesting things this is this is just summation over e all possible e so uh, th this is one this has to be one similarly this has to be one okay so many of the terms after you push in the summation because of this factorization again because see this is a complete distribution in itself the distribution itself only D is there, no other term is there. It's a distribution only on D, conditioned on B, C. So if you sum up over D, it's going to be one, since it's a distribution. So basically, you are eliminating these two terms, and you are left with only this term. And here, there are only, you see, if you look at the summation, this is one term, two term. Uh, and uh, and uh, how many? Uh, there are uh, sorry, there are four terms here, four terms and two terms here each. So there are total eight terms instead of the uh, twenty terms that we have that was required. If you don't use the factorization, if you don't use the factorization. Okay, so if you so the motto is if you can intelligently use the factorization and reorder, move around your summations. And then some of the terms will be, some of the summations will be eliminated altogether. You end up with lesser number of terms to be summed over, lesser number of computation. And it, uh, naturally, it's a more efficient method. Okay. So now the thing is that I have done this in an ad hoc manner. I have, I have uh, manually inspected and done this. The question is that. Uh, can we uh, do this as in the form of an algorithm? As it turns out, you cannot actually encode this as an algorithm for the general case. For arbitrary directed acyclic graph, you cannot write, it, write this down as a general purpose algorithm. But you can do it, you can write it down in fact as a very simple algorithm for a particular type of directed acyclic graph known as singly corrected directed acyclic graph. Okay, as a singly corrected directed acyclic graph. Okay, so the definition is a DAG is singly corrected if its underlying undirected graph, if you remove the edge arrows, the underlying directed graph is a tree. That means if you take two nodes, there is one and only one path between them. There is always a path between them, but there is only one path between them. Okay, so uh, that's the property of a tree. A any tree will have that property. So if a DAG is a tree, uh, sorry, a DAG is singly connected. If you remove the direction of the edges, it becomes a tree. It, 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 look, it is a tree. And uh, the corollary for that is if you look at any two nodes, there is always one path between them and there is only one path between them. 
so we'll 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 uh, uh, talk about and message passing like of algorithm it's like a it's like the computation flows along this tree computation moves along this tree uh, and after it moves uh, moves across the entire tree you get the answer for your query you get the probability value you get you do that you have completed your inference all right so the general form that we want to do in a inference is that for some set of nodes not some this is for some set of nodes in the graph so take any set of nodes in the graph suppose i take C, D, and E, which we sometimes say it is the variable you want to infer or you want to find out. It's a target variable sometimes. Given some evidence, E, which may be some other sets of nodes. Uh, let's say the evidence, so this is your X, and let's say the another set of evidence is E. This is your E. And this E are observed. That means they are set to constants. They are observed. We can set them. They are observed. OK, so a subset of the nodes in the graphical model are observed. We call them as evidence. And a subset of the node in the graphical model are target. That means we want to compute their. We are interested in their probability values given uh, the uh, evidences. So we want to find Px given the evidences or conditioned on the evidences. OK, so this may be things like we want to find out, uh, say we are doing a fault diagnosis of a very big uh, automobile. We are in, so this variable C, D, they are things like the brake, the oil, the pump, uh, the engine and things like that. And we are interested in, let's say, the probability that something is a set of variables, say the pump and the brake and the lights, they are working properly or not, given that you have observed some other variable. Let's say the battery is working properly, the, uh, the exhaust is working, working properly. So those are your evidences, those you have measured. And you are interested in, let's say, the brake and the pump and the engine. So these are your uh, target variables. There may be many other variables which you are not at all interested. We are neither are you observed, neither are you interested in them. Okay, let's say the 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 tire quality or let's say the environmental pollution. Maybe these are other variables which are, you are not interested in. So your any inference task is, I mean, obviously, is basically computing this probability value for some x and e given the graph and along with its conditional probability table. <coughs> so in the inference procedure, pro process, the input to the inference process is a full DAG with a full conditional probability table or a distribution. And the output is the probability value for a particular query. Uh, say a query like Px, given, what is Px given e? This, this is the output of this inference procedure. And the inference algorithm, what it will do, it will use those conditional probability tables, it will use those factorizations, it will do a set of additions and divisions and multiplications and throw out this answer, Px given e. <coughs> Our goal here is to give such a structured or a efficient, structured and efficient computation or inference algorithm. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so let us look at the special case of singly connected tags. As you have said, it's a tree. So uh, one interesting property is that if you look at any node, if you look at any node, let's say you look at the node uh, C. Mm 
anyway leave it it does not waste time okay so if you look at any node let's say i am looking at x uh, uh, looking at sorry c okay it divides the evidence part the e part into upstream and doubts uh, downstream we call it as e x plus and e x minus so x divides e into a plus part and a minus part the plus part is the upstream part so for example if your e if your evidence let's let's take this say x equals c and e equals let's say the set b and d okay so you see this x that is c divides the evident into two part so x e upstream would be b and x e downstream would be d okay the 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 evidences are either a predecessor of c or a successor of c it, it, it divides the evidences into two parts this is uh, and and i use this notation ex plus and ex minus similarly uh, and this is true only for a singly connected dag you don't have this property for a uh, uh, multiply connected dag you have this only for a singly connected dag and it's easy to prove that this will always be the case it's actually since it is a tree you can easily prove that this is always the case any node is either upstream or downstream it cannot be both upstream means if you start from b if you follow a directed path if you follow a directed or you'll come to c you can always come to c and downstream means if you start with c if you follow a directed path you will go to d okay so if you start from an upstream node you will end up in the current node if you start from the current node you end up in a downstream node following only the directed paths okay so uh, similarly every edge x to y let's take the edge a to c let's take the edge a to c it divides the evidences again into upstream and downstream that means the evidences are uh, if you if you if you uh, if you start from a evidence and if you start moving towards uh, uh, towards x that is c here you will pass through this edge it will pass through this edge okay and uh, downstream again means if you if you take an edge and if you if you have an evidence if, if you go through this edge you will be able to reach the evidence this is e plus x y and e minus x y this also is a property of a singly connected tag now we have a uh, be, be, so given this observation we can now devise a simple message passing like algorithm for computing p x given e the algorithm goes like this it starts from a evidence you know because evidences are given they are constants it starts from a evidence it starts from a evidence and then it computes some kind of intermediate probability values which we call as a message and passes it on to another node that node does some local computation updates the message and again passes it on on to the subsequent node okay so that's why uh, this this messages are since they are temporary or intermediate probability values they are called beliefs and these beliefs propagate i i can give you an physical example maybe give you an physical example yes let's take this this difficulty grade intelligence set so i want to uh, suppose i have the evidence that a student is intelligent and i want to find out the probability that the letter of recommendation is good so basically i want to find out what is the probability of letter of recommendation being good given intelligence 
equal to good. Okay, so this is my inference goal or inference task. So what belief propagation does is that because intelligence is already observed, I already know that a student is good. So I propagate it, propagate my belief like this. Okay, intelligence is good. All right. What is the probability that a grade is high? Okay, you sum it up over all the neighbors, marginalize over all the all the neighbors, which are which is difficulty in this case. Find out the probability that a grade is good. So you compute a message here, which is kind of an intermediate probability. It's kind of a belief that okay, this student is intelligent, his grade will be good. And now you again pass on this message. All right. Um, if this grade is good, what is the probability he has a good letter? Okay, this is the probability. You propagate the same. Get another message. And then finally, you uh, this is your target variable letter. So you end up there and you compute the final probability. We will see how. So this is the idea. So in a large network, this kind of belief will go on propagating. I will explain concretely the algorithm. <coughs> All right. So uh, let's consider a variable. Any variable X need not be the target variable. The probability of a particular variable X given the evidence. All right. Let's initially consider. In fact, we will see later that it's, it can it can be any variable. Let, let's say it's a target variable X. So P of X given E is uh, by definition p of joint probability x and e divided by p of e and since e is has now two parts e plus and e minus it is p of x joined with p of e plus and e minus and similarly this is p of e plus and e minus e plus is upstream evidence e minus is downstream evidence And this quantity is proportional. This ratio is proportional to product of two quantities. Product of two quantities. OK, uh, first quantity is Px given E plus. Px given E plus times Pe minus given X and E plus. P e minus given x and e plus. Uh, this you can actually easily show if we expand this ratio. If we expand this ratio and you expand this expression for the joint probability table. Uh, basically, if you multiply these two quantities, you will see that this is this by n a constant. OK, if you multiply these two probabilities, you will end up with this times a constant. So now let us uh, look at these uh, two factors. The first factor is fine, P of X given E plus. While the second factor, P of E minus given X and uh, P plus is, is, uh, is can be reduced. Because, because of the singly connected property, and if you remember your D separation definition, X is a block. X blocks a path from E plus to E minus. X D separates E plus and E minus. So if this is your, your E plus and this is your E minus, any path between them are blocked by X. Are blocked by X. So X D separates E plus from E minus. And from the property of D separation, we know that if it is deseparated, that means E minus is conditionally independent of E plus given X. E minus is conditionally independent of E plus given X. So that means this quantity, this second term can be written as this. You can drop the E plus part. You can drop the E plus part because of the deseparation property. Note that all this holds only for singly connected curves. OK, so this will give some name to this. The first product Px given E plus we call as pi of X. 
and the second part p x minus given x. Note that there is a causality. It's like evidence here evidence causes x and here x causes evidence because it is upstream evidence this is a downstream evidence. So the causality is reverse in each of these cases. The causality has nothing to do with evidence. Evidence is what is convenient for you to observe. Whereas causality is with regard to the probabilities. Mm. So we have two terms, each dependent on x. They are called pi x and lambda x, the upstream part and the downstream part. So if we can, so if you are interested to compute p x given e, where e has two parts, upstream and downstream. You can do it by computing pi x and lambda x separately and multiplying them. Okay, now this can go back recursively. This can grow back recursively. We will soon see that this pi x can be computed by a similar local algorithm for the parents of x and the parents of parents of x and so on. So this pi and lambda, uh, they are, so basically pi x is kind of a, 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 a can be again computed by a local message passing among the parents of x and those pairs. So a recursive kind of algorithm can be given both for pi x and lambda x. The third thing is that, um, if I, uh, uh, this is also very important in this recursive process is that if you have already received a message from some node, so the see message passing is you receive a message from some node and pass it on to something. The good thing about this algorithm, this message passing algorithm is if you have received, it's devised in such a way, if you have received a message from a node, you need not send back. That part is over, that part is complete. It doesn't need any further computation. You need not send it back. Okay, so uh, this is the algorithm. So this actually, uh, I have explained it for the directed graph. You can easily extend it to undirected models too. Mm. So in fact, what is done is that both directed and undirected models are expressed as factor graphs. Mm, from my previous lecture, you should know what is factor graphs. Factor graphs is, for example, if you have a factorization of the joint distribution, you introduce a factor node represented by these small black boxes, which represent each factors. And so each factors connect up a number of variables, which falls in the scope of the factor. For example, F1 has in its scope X1 and X2, F2 has X2 and X3, F3 has X2 and X4. You connect up the factors, and thus you get your factor graphs. Uh, now factor graphs again can be singly connected or multi -connect, multiply connected. The idea is very simple. Uh, if there is a, this, since these are undirected now, if there is a, if there is a path, only one path from one node to another node, then you call it singly connected, otherwise it's called multiply connected. For example, here x3 to x4, in the second graph, there are two paths, so it's not singly connected. So I'll explain this uh, belief propagation algorithm for the factor graphs. Okay, let me uh, write down the notations. Let Nx denote the set of factor nodes that are neighbor. So write down, so you, you take a variable x and let's say Nx denote its neighbor factor node, that is this box. So for, Nx for x2 is f1, f2, and f3. Nx for f, x2 is f1, f2, and x3. Similarly, Nf for a factor node is the set of variable nodes that are neighbors are a. So if we take, so Nf of f2 is x2 and x3. Nf of f2 is x2 and x3. Okay, so so here is the, uh, I, I'll define what is a message. So the message passed from X to F, I call it as mu X to F. So this is the message passed from X to F. 
of course it is a function of x it depends on what node it is the message is defined this way it is a product of the messages passed from h to x it's product of the messages so if the message you pass from x to f which we call as mu x to f is the product of the messages from h to x where h are all the neighbor factor graphs of f you take the neighbor so this is h1 this is h2 these are again factors okay so this is say um, h1 to x and this is say h2 to x so this h is all the set of factors which are neighbors of x excluding f itself excluding to what we are providing excluding f itself except that all the neighbors you take and you take their product you take their product that's and that's so basically you if you know the messages that are passed to x it's like neural network kind of thing. You multiply them over instead of adding, you multiply them over and pass to F. This is mu x to F. Now, what is mu f to x? Mu x to f to x is the summation, summation over all variables accepting x, over all variables accepting x, fx, where fx is a factor fx is all the factors present in the factor in the graph except all, all the factors present in the graph okay so take all such factors excepting those containing x multiply by mu y to f where y are all the neighbors of factor f, f y are all the neighbors of factor f okay so now i am passing from a factor a node. I am passing from a factor f to a node. So what I do, I find out all the y1, y2 neighbors of f. I find out their mu y1 to f, mu y2 to f. Multiply them out. Multiply them out. Weight it by f of x. Weight it by f of x. F, f is a factor. So I can weight it by f of x and, and then pass it to. Uh, so th this, this gives me this term. And these I add up for all the, all the x's beside x, beside small x. All the variables beside small x, I add this up. Okay, all, uh, note that this is a time consuming step. You, you have to add up. So here is where the recursion will come in. You have to add up over this and then this gives you the message. Okay, so how does this uh, uh, recursively proceed? How does it start? How does it proceed? So this is clear. This is I have what I have just defined what a message is. I have defined how to compute this message and why it is this way that will come later why it is defined this way <coughs> okay so now you start the process like this if a variable has just one factor as neighbor it can initiate a message propagation if it has only one factor as if it has multiple neighbors you cannot initiate you start with a variable which is having only one factor only one factor typically there will be variables like this uh, say p a it's not appearing in anywhere else sorry not appearing in anywhere else you start with that variable point this is how you start and how you terminate once a variable has received all messages from its neighboring factor nodes you can find out the probability of that variable by multiplying, just multiplying the messages over all the neighbors, multiplying the messages over all the factor neighbors. 
and this is just a proportionality. If you want to get the actual probability, you have to normalize it. You have to normalize it by adding up over all the neighbors. Hmm. Adding up over, uh, sorry, not all the neighbors, all the x's. All the values of excess you have to do, and then you have to normalize. Okay, uh, so uh, so uh, this satisfies my final goal. My final goal was to find px. Was go, uh, goal was to find px. So I have found px just by multiplying the messages. Let me give an example. It will become clear. So this is a simply connected factor graph. You have two variables, three variables, four variables, x1, x2, x3, x4, have three factors, f1, f2, f3. <coughs> okay, so you start with any node which has a single factor neighbor. So you can start with x1. You compute the message that x1 parts to, passes to f1. You start with the same, uh, value let's say one constant value one similarly x3 is singly connected to f2 you start with constant value one okay now let us see what does f1 transmit to x2 what does f1 pass to x2 by the previous definition of messages we are seeing that we look at the neighbors of x2 and uh, they are messages I will I'll, I'll combine so uh, and weight it so which is one in this case and weight it by f1 of x1 x2 f1 of x1 x2 this I'll find out hmm. so mm, this if we apply this formula this second formula here mu f2 x you will get this Similarly, I find what message does f2 pass to x2. This will be this. Now, let us look at what does x2 pass to f3. So now, uh, since uh, uh, x2 has received the messages from f1 and f2 already, it can now pass the message to f3. So now x2 will pass this message to f3. This message, as I have, if you now you look at the first formula again, is the product of the messages passed to it because it is x to f3. So you, you take the product of this and this, so you get x2 to f3. And you repeat this. Similarly, once you compute uh, f3 receives message from x2, so you have already got that message, now pass it to x4 by this formula. Okay. So uh, you have passed this. So after you have got all these messages, and, and by the way, this, this sequence in you are passing this message is called a message schedule. You can actually follow other schedule also. Okay, so now, uh, uh, so this is an example case where none of the variables are observed, the evidence set is zero, uh, since I started with one. Now suppose I have an evidence, I have an evidence that x1 equal to a, x1 equal to a is an evidence. So I represent it by this delta, which says that delta is a probability distribution, which takes, which takes a value 1 only at a and 0 everywhere else. So this is equivalent to saying that xa has been observed to be a, x1 has been observed to be a. If you have done that, the message from x1 to f1 is a delta at a. The message from x3 to f2, x3 is still unobserved, so it's a constant one. I, I start with a constant one. It will, it will uh, uh, I mean, uh, because see, this is not my target. I am not actually interested in what this probability is. My target is something else. And I apply the formulas. I am not uh, repeating them. And we get this schedule. We kind of get this schedule. Mm, so sigma x1, uh, f1, f2, you just follow this, uh, the formulas mentioned, you get this schedule. Finally, you f3 to x4, you compute. Uh, one interesting, I, I'll come to the final probability computation. One interesting thing to note in this, uh, but one thing I think you can already guess that if you look at the nature of the messages and if you look at the definition of the final probability, 
it is a product of the messages that a node has received. It's already coming out to be the summation and the product marginalization, product factorization from that in a in a brute force way that we have already we used to do earlier. Okay. One interesting thing to note is that look at this thing, this X1, F1, some of the terms, as we have said before, that some terms are constant and if we add them up, they become one, they get eliminated. So this process is known as variable elimination. Specifically, if a if a uh, if a variable value is observed, that is value is given. So it is a constant and all the factors that you get intermediate are constant. So you don't actually need a message passing for them. You can just substitute them. OK, so in effect, what it means is that you can remove the if you have observed the variable, you can remove that node from the graph altogether in the message. So if you remove from the node from the bird, your message passing will become smaller. You need to pass message to one node less. So you eliminate it from the graph by removing the node and you modify all its factor neighbors so that as if the value coming from here is a constant that you have to do a bookkeeping. Sometimes if it is, uh, there is another way of eliminate. This is this observed variable that you have eliminate. You can also sometimes, because as I have said before that if you give a sound to one and all those things, you can remove a hidden variable if you are not interested and you eliminate in, in, in the graph. How do you do it? As I have mentioned before, you marginalize or sum it up, then it goes away. Hmm. And the reason you want to eliminate is you are not interested in that variable. Hmm. You are not interested. So, <coughs> for example, I want to eliminate Xi. Hmm. So what I'll do, I'll sum up over all possible marginalize over Xi, the remaining thing. So this Xi term will come out. It will factorize into two part. Xi term will come out and this will call it F nu and X nu. So here F nu is, uh, is, the, is the sum of the messages accepting that I. OK, so what this means is that basically in your factor graph if you want to eliminate a node you are not so I, I am not interested in x2 it's a hidden node i am not interested because it's a hidden node so i can sort of collapse this i can collapse this and merge it uh, uh, all the neighboring nodes into one factor node so i can create a new factor node and merge f1 f2 f3 into a new factor node OK, so it's basically multiplying two factors to create a larger factor. OK, so let me give. Uh, so this is the general algorithm for belief propagation or message passing. Uh, let me explain uh, its particular application to the directed graph and how we are computing the probability in the directed graph. Note that. Uh, in the in the in the undirected graph, there is uh, the probability is not so direct. Probability needs a big normalization. In the directed graph, it's direct. So as you have said before, that p is pi times lambda, it's pi times lambda, where pi is p of u i, given its upstream evidences, and lambda is p of downstream evidences given x. So <coughs> UI, let's say call it as the upstream evidence. That uh, uh, so sorry, P UI is a, any upstream node, and this uh, this is the this pi x is the message UI sends to x. This is pi x. UI sends to x. Similarly, lambda yj yj is any downstream node. Lambda yj is any any. Um, evidence sent from x to lambda, uh, sorry, x to yj. And this we call pi, this is called yj. As it turns out that these messages in the case of directed graph are nothing but these probabilities, are nothing but these probabilities. Okay, and you can get your probability of x 
just by multiplying lambda and pi and suitably normalizing suitably normalizing so the probability of x given e is 1 by a normalizing factor lambda x into pi x where lambda x is product of all the messages uh, sent to downstream nodes from x so what you do to basically compute all the downstream messages that you have passed just multiply them and pi is similarly sum of all the upstream messages uh, messages sent from upstream nodes ui's weighted by this conditional so you get all this upstream but now you don't directly multiply them sorry you first multiply them then you weight them by this px you remember the message passing the second part of the message passing algorithm weighted by this px which is which has f of this in this case and sum it up over all the parent nodes so for the downstream you have to just multiply for the parents you have to do a weighted sum of this product and then you get your pi x and this p x given is, is just proportional to lambda x into pi x <coughs> okay so this is uh, and this can be recursive that means this can propagate so this we have done from x i pass it to downstream then again pass to downstream so there is a basically there is a bottom up propagation from uh, from uh, from u to uh, from x to u rather you can say and there is a top down provision right so there is a bottom up and a top down provision so basically all the messages recursively come down like this and all the messages go up like this the, this coming from upstream and downstream they get multiplied producted they get multiplied and that's your probability so it's it's it that's it it's like you are you are standing in a junction road from one side all the messages come from other side all the messages come you just multiply them get your message and pass it on to the your downstream and your upstream <coughs> okay so uh, so this and this can be easily implemented many of these uh, probabilistic programming languages that you have uh, in python and many other languages they implemented this basic belief propagation algorithm to compute these probabilities hmm. i suggest you to go through these steps once more hmm. uh, uh, through the through the figures that i have given you go through these steps one more then actually you have to you can understand in a better way but they can be easily written down as an algorithm but again all this is for singly connected uh, graphs you cannot apply them to multiply connected graphs hmm. it's it's and these are very efficient actually if you if you actually implement and run any of them there are many toolboxes also like bezia and other toolboxes there which implement this really proposition and they are very fast even for a very large graph in a gfi they do it hmm. so they are very efficient but uh, they have an disadvantage that they can apply only to singly connected tags or 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 factor graphs okay so uh, let me stop here in the next class i will uh, explain some algorithms for multiply connected and you will see that it's difficult to have a algorithm for multiply connected so we will go for something called approximate inference where you can compute only an approximate version of the probability uh, using methods like gibbs sampling and variational inference so uh, we will do that in the next class thank you